shortcut uh, solution to chapter nine hypothesis testing. So before we show you the shortcut, let's take it from the very beginning, which is to outline the problem. The problem is we have a random number table in the back of the book. That random number table is our population. It could be the population of everybody in the United States. It could be the population of those individual numbers in the back of the book. We happen to know that a good random number table has an average of 4.5 and a sigma of 2.87, as we established several times already throughout the previous parts of the spinner assignment. So somebody would like to know if a, a, a brand new random number table that was published truly has a value of 4.5 or not. And of course, the best way to solve the problem is by calculating the average of all the members of that population, but very often you can't access so many people or so many items. So you use, the second best thing is you take a sample, and we're taking a, an admittedly small sample of five, and we're gonna pick five numbers out of the back of the book at random so it's to be representative of the whole table. And of course, the next logical thing to do is to calculate the average of those five numbers. And the next logical thing to do is to say if the number, the average is close to 4.5, we're going to accept the A0, which of course is, mu is truly 4.5. You know, we give the benefit of the doubt to the A0 because it represents the status quo. And H1 is that the average of the table really is messed up. It has an average different than 4.5. And we said last time, well, how close should it be? Well, that was really the whole main purpose of the chapter is to come up with a number, a boundary, so that if it's close to the 4.5 within the boundary, we're gonna say we're gonna accept the A0. As I told you last time, the proper terminology is do not reject A0. And if the number is pretty far from 4.5, let's say it comes out to 8.8, .8, then that means we're going to believe the H1 and we're gonna reject the A0. So the two possibilities are to reject the A0 or do not reject the A0. And the way we did it last time was by creating a series of pictures, the same three pictures that we made in chapter seven, and that helped us figure out the logic of where the boundary should come from. The first picture called the population picture, and the mathematical representation of the random number table is called the uniform distribution between zero and nine. And under a zero, if the a zero really is true, that table should have an average of 4.5, which you can indicate by this, and as a side matter, we know the sigma or the spread is 2.87, and if one would take a sample of five numbers from a population like that, from the central limit theorem and all our knowledge of chapter seven, we know from that, that we're gonna end up with the X bar. The results from that will come out, if you did it many, many times, take five numbers and graph the average, take another five numbers. If you, if you do this hypothetically many, many times, the resulting distribution of the X bar is called the sampling distribution of the mean. We'll have, first of all, a bell-shaped curve by the central limit theorem. We'll have a middle value equal to the middle value of the population where the numbers are being drawn from. That's, I haven't proved that to you, but it's really common sense, and you've seen that when you did the spinner assignment. And also from chapter seven, the amount of spread from average to average, or how much it deviates from the ideal, because we don't expect every single average to be exactly 4.5. The standard error, the mean formula, which, of course, that little tiniest formula of the whole term practically, sigma over n is 287 over five, which is 1.28. And then we, we try different boundaries, and after we got a boundary, we said, is that boundary a good boundary or a bad boundary? Because we our, our real goal is to, is to come up with a boundary, or, which is really called the decision rule. And we decided to, to decide if a boundary is good or bad based on how often it gives us the right answer, or conversely, how often it gives us the wrong answer. And that wrong answer is called a type one error. So we basically, we'd like to know how often a type one error occurs, which in this case would represent rejecting H0, well, in every case, when H0 really is true, which in the case of a, let's say we picked a boundary, let's say, uh, um, I think we tried two and seven, after a whole bunch of trial and error, this, is, this represents the result of many, many uh, previous calculations, we decided two and seven is really the, the pretty good boundary, because if you end up, if you end up with a ba an average bigger than seven, you're gonna, your decision is gonna be, to, I'm rejecting a zero. If it's lower than two, you're gonna say reject a zero, but if it's in between two and seven, then the decision is to do not reject a zero. And the only question is, uh, is this particular pair of boundaries a good boundary? And we did it by evaluating the probability of making a type one error 
The probability of rejecting A0 when A0 is true. The probability of getting an X bar bigger than 7 or an X bar lower than 7 when the average is truly 4.5, which is basically dealing with a good, if we we're dealing with a good random number table. And all those things are called alpha. And the way we calculate alpha, besides looking at the picture and guessing what that number is based on how we did it in chapter 6 and 7, we also did it more exactly by going to a Z diagram. And the Z diagram was 0 and 1. We converted the 7. Again, this was the result of lots of previous calculations at 7. But 7, to verify that it's the right answer, you convert it to a Z diagram. How do you convert it? By the formula from chapter 6, x minus mu over sigma. Also a pretty small formula, as the formulas go. But in the case of chapter 7, we upgraded that to x bars. And let's say 7 minus 4.5 over 1.28 comes out to, I don't know, what does it come out to, 1.95? Anybody please calculate that? I think, Laura, you're the person who came up with 7 last time. You, you, so what was that calculation? I'll, I'll bother you. 1.90 what? What's it come out to? That's the key calculation. To, to verify that 7 is a, a so-called the right number that we're looking for, yes? 1.95. Okay, so 1.95, which is roughly around over here. Here's 1, here's 2, so we're a little bit before 2. And of course, if I plug in 2 into this formula, you should actually do it if you don't see it mathematically, you're going to get minus 1.95. So you can calculate the Acceptance and rejection region, not in terms of the original X bars, which are hard to work with. Let's deal with the Z scores, which is do not reject A0. Just simply shifting everything over to like a new scale, but it's the same basic picture. This will be reject A0 and reject A0. And the only question is, what is that area to the left of minus 1.95? And it comes out to approximately 2.5%. Because remember, we're trying to shoot. We would like alpha to be around 5% if it's going to give us a, an error rate that's small, but not too small. Because remember, we don't want to make it too small because it messes up the beta, the type 2 error, which I'm not going to get into right now to confuse it. But So we make it small, but not too small. And what is the area to the left of minus 1.95? You're going to see it's around 2.5%. I'm not going to put down the exact number right now, but it's around 2.5%, 0.025, which means the area to the right of this is, excuse me, is, is bigger than one. So the, the, the 2.5% chance, why does that happen? If the chance of getting below 1.95 is 2.5%, and the chance of getting above 1.9 is 2.5%. So the alpha in this case is truly 5%. So that means we came up with the proper boundary that we were looking for. So now, let's, this is going to be a trick question, and it's really important that you understand the trick and also the answer to the question. Remember, this 2 and 7 itself was the result of many, many calculations. For those of you who did the homework, I'm not going to start... Uh, browbeating all those majority clubs who didn't do it. But if you did the homework, you know, conscientiously, it's been assignment 31 or 32. Um, and this, by the way, I'm sorry, this might also um, uh, can be labeled spinner assignment 30, 35 for the video purposes. Okay, it was more than 35. It's really explaining the whole theory of chapter 9 and chapter 10, or the practical aspect of it. Anyway, this 2 and 7 itself was the result of many, many previous calculations that we found. We tried 3 and 6, we tried 3.5 and 6.5, and finally we, got, we came up with 2 and 7. So, but what was our original question? Is the random number table a good table or a bad table? Random number table okay. Random number table not okay. So, again, I'm telling you, it's a trick question. What's the answer to the question? Is this all these calculations, again, lots and lots of calculations in Greek letters, alpha and sigma, and mu's, all kinds of theory went into this, but we did a lot, we've been talking about it for literally for weeks already. What's the answer? We just had a 2 and 7 as the final answer, so to speak. So what's the answer to our original question? Is the random number table a good table or a bad table? But if, before you answer, realize it's a trick question. Yes, David. The answer is we don't know yet, so that's excellent. Why, what, what, what's missing? There's one thing missing here that, that before we can answer the question. That's, most people never realize that. What's missing? Uh, Tony? The average. In other words, this, this, what we just created by this extensive, literally, you could, two guys can. Um, um, we just ex 
created what's called a decision rule, that if we get a certain average, we'll check to see if that average is in between 2 and 7, and then we're going to say do not project a 0, but we don't.